Hello, my name is Wes Dawson, and no, this is not an auditory hallucination or some twisted, deep-rooted subconscious fantasy of yours. It's Wednesday. It's a new episode of Gabagool and 8. So for this week, we are going to dive back into yesteryear of yours truly. We're going to look at the past of Wes Dawson during my more formidable adolescent years and just take a peek at some of the events that shaped my young mind. You see, this week will be an epic tale, a coming-of-age story, a lesson about life, a lesson about becoming a man, a lesson about knowing who you are and just exactly where your place is in the world. You see, in life, we all have challenges, we all have obstacles, but it is how we react and how we act with these challenges and obstacles that will define who we will become later in life. Now, actually, come to think of it, that background music really isn't appropriate. I, I think maybe uh, we could cue up something a little more apropos considering uh, these stories I'm about to tell. Ah, yes, that's much better. You see, because of course, I am talking about Animal Hill at New Hampshire Motor Speedway located in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Now, this is a racetrack, and of course, I'm not talking about the races. I don't really remember any of the events of the races. It's about the party surrounding the track on the weekend of the event. So this racetrack has been part of the NASCAR Premier Racing Series since 1990. Now, at the time that I went, I believe it was the Nextel Cup Series, maybe the Sprint Mobile Cup Series. I can't be too sure. NASCAR went through a period where they were going through sponsors like I do, CERB, and EI applications. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly who the sponsor was. Either way, it was the NASCAR Premier Series and the Bush Series at the time that we'd go watch the races for. So there'd be a group of my family members, my father, a bunch of his friends, uh, pretty much a guy's trip down there in this old scuzzy camper um, from, I don't know, 1976 full with like, it was like a bang wagon, swag carpets, and we would pile in as many sweaty rednecks in there as humanly possible, go down to New Hampshire, party our faces off, watch a little bit of racing, and just have a hell of a time. There was so much booze. There was so much adolescent drunkenness. Of course, not condoned by uh, my father or any of the adults there um, uh, to protect the guilty. Let's just say uh, all this was forced upon me against my will. So, yeah, there's my legal disclaimer. Now, at this party, there was this thing, Animal Hill, because basically around the racetrack, there was a big section of land set aside for campers, recreational vehicles to be able to park, people camp out for the weekend that they were there, and a certain section was quartered off at the time, I think it was Section F. I don't know if they changed that every year, but it was known as Animal Hill. And Animal Hill was basically, if you said, hey, I don't need a curfew. I don't want to be lights out at 11. I just want to drink until I pass out or get sick. Wake up. Do it again. Uh, it was a magical place, a magical time. And honestly, the power of mob mentality and the power of a flashlight was like nothing you'd ever seen. At this time, there were still ads running on TV for like those Girls Gone Wild videos before social media basically replaced those with free content. And if you had a strong enough flashlight, basically you would point this at other drunken young female rednecks and they would be more than happy to display their bare breasts to you. So as a 15, 16, and 17 year old for the years I'd went down, it was truly a spiritual experience and something I cherish to this very day. A friend we'll call Norm walked me to the center of Animal Hill where there was a tree and a sapling with all its uh, greenery stripped of it, replaced with beer cans, bras, panties. It was true. It was, it was like seeing the Rockefeller Christmas tree lit for the very first time. It was truly a magical experience. Now, I can remember quite a bit from these trips, not all of it. Some of that may be due to the particular beverages that we enjoyed at these events. Some of it may be due to head trauma that I suffered in later years. I can't be too sure. Either way, I've lined up three particular stories that are of, I guess, uh, relative interest to anyone listening. And uh, I'll just share those with you and I'll share anything else I can remember. Like I said, I don't think the memories I have could be fit within an eight minute episode. So I picked out three real bangers. And I'd like to point out that these aren't even like my top three stories. These are just three stories that I could remember. And I'll just explain a little bit, at least the cover image for this week's episode, that, that severed image of Rusty Wallace. Well, like I said, this was just 
acres of property, campers just partying their faces off. And at one point I found a, a circle of people who were burning a cardboard cutout of Rusty Wallace. I was like, what the heck? Rusty is a, he's a great racer. He seems like a genuinely nice person. Why would they be doing this? What, what drunken shenanigans could have led to this? So I had to breach this circle. I ran in trying to save Rusty. Of course, the angry mob didn't particularly care. They grabbed at him while this piece of cardboard was burning. So in the end, I just ripped his head off, ran away, held it up in a gesture of victory and got a, a rousing applaud from the crowd outside of this this little mob, this violent group that was happening. And honestly, I felt like a king. Okay, so the first story, I'll just call it uh, the motorbike tire pissing. I don't really know how to describe it. So here I am exploring the grounds with my brother and my friend Ryan, and we notice a crowd of people getting very excited about something. We approach this gang and we see there's a gentleman on his motorcycle doing burnouts and he's asking the crowd to assist him as much as possible. So as we approach it, what we see is there's a group of people trying to hold down the front of the motorcycle while this gentleman, heavily inebriated with his eyes crossed, basically like one touching his bottom cheek and one trying to dangle just above his eyebrow, uh, burning out so much that the tire was melting off the rear end of his motorcycle. So then a few of us decided, well, let's help cool it down. They were pouring beer on it, but I thought what better way to do this than to have four or five of us piss on the back end of his motorcycle. So here we are, about six of us, uh, pretty skunked up, pissing all over this guy's motorbike, burning out until he just destroyed the tread, uh, metal wire flying everywhere. It was great. I don't know if he did this intentionally, if he brought spare tires, or if he's going to have bigger issues the next morning other than just a hangover. The second story is a bit of a love story, truly uh, a romantic tale for the ages. I was a young 16-year-old boy, spry, bright-eyed, just really ready to soak in the world. Here we are walking down the pathway, because there, there was like a, a paved path leading to all the parking sections, so we're walking down the pathway, and I see this woman standing on a picnic table outside of her camper, and she's just doing something I had only seen on either scrambled satellite feeds or on very slow loading uh, dial up internet pornography. Uh, this girl was, how could I say this without being overly graphic on my uh, child friendly comedy podcast? Let's just say she was stirring up the old skunk guts with at least two fingers in front of a crowd of drunken men, very excited to see this. So I joined the crowd, said, wow, is this what true love really is? Uh, only to have her boyfriend or her husband or maybe her incestuous brother, somebody come out angrily, you know, denouncing the crowd for standing there watching this woman churning up some panty butter and drug her back into the RV. Booze were heard, beers were hurled. It, it was truly a sight to be seen. So the final story for this week's episode, of course, is a tale about cheap beer and mob mentality. So again, alongside my friend Ryan, we were walking through the past, taking looks at all the different events taking place. And one main thing you have to know is that after nightfall, uh, you don't take your car out. If you want to go to McDonald's, you want a day, let's go get a nice steak with the family. If you're parked in Animal Hill, leaving after nightfall is a bad idea unless you're willing to you know, burn out until your tires are basically racing slicks because uh, every group of drunken people, which there were thousands of them, would in fact force you to do a burnout with your car. Some people were smart. They brought spare tires to do exactly that. Others would try to resist the urge of this drunken mob and it just would not turn out well. So there was one guy in a Jeep Cherokee. We were just watching this take place. Uh, people begging him to burn out. He refused. He was yelling at the crowd. They're getting aggressive. He gets out of his car to go yell at the guy who had been pushing sort of the front fender of his truck. Come on, burn out! Uh, when he got out of his Cherokee, some guy got in the driver's seat and tried to do the burnout. The guy got pissed, pulled him out, and then obviously more people were swarming to see what was going on. Uh, this guy, you could see, was becoming a little bit panicked, realizing the situation was kind of getting away from him. And my friend and Ryan and I are approaching as well. We get our hands on the vehicle. We start moving it a bit. And then you see it shaking side to side while the crowd demands, burn out, burn out. And then finally, uh, I won't say who in order again to protect the guilty, either myself or Ryan, somebody decides to yell out, flip it. Next thing you know, we're walking away realizing that, a uh, you know, I don't know if this is a felony, but certainly we're in another country. We don't want to be arrested. And the fact that I was 16 years old doesn't help. I can't confirm that the Cherokee had been flipped onto its roof, but it was certainly dancing on two wheels to two wheels with the passenger mirror damn well touching the asphalt. So 
Uh, I can't conclusively say what happened, but honestly, I think the lesson was learned. Don't leave Animal Hill at night. Well, much like how every gripping episode of Gabagool Nate must come to an end, the sheer chaos and or delight and ecstasy that was Animal Hill was doomed to end as well. Now, there are certainly more stories to share, but I believe the actual Animal Hill is now but a myth, but a legend, but a forgotten relic of yesteryear. As the last year that we went, it was a very different experience. Very, very heavy police presence. Um, state troopers on horseback, cars stationed everywhere. The last year that we were there, actually it was the year that I recuperated the severed head of Rusty Wallace. The organizers of this event had the wonderful idea of handing out liquid fire starter to every drunken redneck pulling into this campground. So you're pulling in, you're already half in the bag. They're like, here's a bottle of Duraflame. Go light stuff on fire. I was writing my name on the asphalt. People were burning picnic tables. Uh, by the end of the weekend, two RVs had been completely burnt to the ground. Quite a few porta potties. And um, yeah, so it was a bit of a mess, quite chaotic. And I could kind of understand why they maybe wanted to tone things down. But unfortunately, the golden era of Animal Hill, I do believe has passed. But that doesn't mean that we can't desperately cling on to our past happy memories as we force ourselves through the grim drudgery of everyday life. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. My name is Wes Dawson. This has been Gabagool Nate. Please listen, like, share, and subscribe.